I remember hearing someone say once that the common plight of humanity, one of the common plights of humanity is that we tend to remember the things we should forget and we tend to forget the things that we should remember. One of the functions of this memorial is that we remember what we should remember. The honor guard started quite a few years back after I came back from my dad's funeral. There was three or four VFW guys who did the presentation and they folded the flag, taps, and all that, and they gave the flag to my stepmom, who has been with my dad for a long, long time. So that was kind of the focal point for me to say, hmm, why don't we have one at the fire department? So when I came back, checked with Chief Wigan, and he said, no, we don't have one. And so I spoke with Tommy Green Association, and I spoke with the union, and they were all in agreement that yes, we should have one. So the association put a lot of funding towards it. So really the moment that we decided to have an honor guard was in Florida National Cemetery when I buried my dad. Rick McLaughlin, now retired uh, paramedic firefighter, approached me, I'm going to guess somewhere around uh, 2003, early, uh, and hit me with the question, do you know anything about an honor guard? And at the time, I, I, I really didn't have a lot of information about an honor guard, but uh, I was inquisitive and asked questions and was interested. Shortly after that, he spoke uh, with, with uh, uh, firefighter paramedic Mike Jolin, who was also interested. And that's how it was born. And Rick McLaughlin had and still has a passion for the honor guard. Uh, in the fire service and every other service as well, military and, and, and police. And uh, he really instilled the fire under Mike Jolin and myself. Rick McLaughlin, um, he came up with the idea of bringing an honor guard to the Bedford Fire Department. And uh, really it kind of stemmed from his uh, military background, his uh, father um, as well was in the military. and. He just felt that there would be a, a need for it here and he didn't want to have a in the line of the duty death uh, come to the, the fire department and not have something there to be prepared for it. Um, so uh, he started uh, asking a couple people. He, I was one of the first three people he talked to about it and trying to figure out how it would be feasible to do it and uh, what we could do to bring uh, an honor guard to Bedford. When I was approached by Rick McLaughlin to establish the Bedford Honor Guard, he came to me knowing that I had experience at Derry Fire Department as the, one of the charter members of the Honor Guard there. And, you know, some of the things that we talked about was funding, uniforms, protocols, training, and what we did uh, in Derry. The union had to be part of it, the Firefighters Association had to be part of it. Uh, and the town, because as you develop a honor guard, you're sending these representatives of your community around the state, New England, and sometimes around the country. So we met with the chief. The chief kind of gave a, approval to move forward. And how are we going to fund the honor guard? Rick came to us as the association, me being the president of the association, and asked if we could start an honor guard, put together an honor guard. So they researched all the information, researched the equipment. Uh, Mike Jolin, John Axon, Rick McLaughlin put together a, a plan, came to the association. Uh, we had a meeting and it was about $12,000 to purchase all the uniforms for 12 members of the department. Uh, all the flags, the custom made axes, which have our uh, fire department patch on them uh, and everything necessary to put an honor guard together. I was the president of the local union local at the time. Um, so I was involved from the beginning because obviously we needed money um, and he approached me and said that with the passing of his uh, father that he wanted to form an honor guard so that we would have a way to show our uh, be, be, the, be, a, be at our best to show our respects to 
fallen firefighters and both within our department and outside our department and to show uh, respect to the families of uh, those involved especially and um, you know he that was that was Rick's way of giving back to to the families that that had suffered a loss obviously when a project comes before me or through the department we kind of make an assessment of you know, where's the commitment coming from? Who's interested in doing the project? And there's always a financial element to it. Uh, we realized that there was a considerable cost to starting up a uh, on a guy with all the special equipment, whether it's the axes, the pike poles, the flags, all the uniforms that are really specialized uniform and they're specific to each individual. It's not really a generic uniform. So we had to get a buy-in from the members who wanted to be part of this honor guide and also the fact that what was the cost going to be in a true commitment that people would be honoring the request for the, a service, whether it was a, somebody requesting an honor guide for marching, uh, a funeral service, or a uh, line of duty death. So it, it was a very serious commitment on those individuals that wanted to organize this, and they've done excellent to this point, you know, to be part of this organization and provide this service, not just here in Bedford, but regionally throughout the state and uh, for many types of activities. Making of the team was an interesting task. So when I came back from Florida, I spoke with the chief, and the chief was pretty much in agreement with it. So I had to sit down and think about, how am I going to make it happen? And any good project needs project manager and also needs team managers. So to pull this forward, I had to find a few guys that were really, I thought, were really going to help me. Not just pacify me, but really help me make this a great, a great honor guard. So, a little trial and error in process. Came up with Mikey Jolin. Mikey Jolin, he was going to be my sergeant at arms. The well, sergeant at arms position basically is He's kind of like the guy that you go to and you say, make this happen. And then you step back. And that's what Mikey was for me. So now you have commander, which was myself. You have your assistant commander, which was Mikey Jolin. So now I needed somebody who can keep us in line. So I said, oh, that's a bigger project than I know what to do with. John Axon came to mind worked with John for quite a few years. John has great people skills from his business and insurance. He really knows how to talk to people and how to pull them together. So I said, John would be a good man on this team. His position was going to be deputy commander or assistant commander, however it went. So with John being on the team, kind of kept Mikey and I in line. Mikey would go one way, I'd go another way, and then we would need a referee. And then come John, and he would pull us all together again, and off we would go. So that's how he came up with the team. Because all, of, all three of us had a passion for, for this honor guard. Rick did ask who, who wanted to be part of it, and it wasn't even a moment's hesitation for me to say, yes, I do want to be a part of this. And it's a lot of pride being able to say you're a charter member of the honor guard because uh, we've had a lot of people join the Honor Guard since, new members of the department. Some uh, members have left the department, uh, so they've left the Honor Guard. So in order to be in our Honor Guard, you have to be a member of the department. So, but me, it's, it's uh, particular pride to be a member of the Honor Guard. Uh, one thing that Rick did when he, uh, we put the Honor Guard together initially was each one of the charter members received a, uh, an American flag pin. Uh, that we each wear on our uniform, but only the charter members of the Honor Guard have that pin. And that was from him personally, and that was for him to pay tribute to his father, which I thought was very, very appropriate. He came to the membership and asked about who was interested in, in being an Honor Guard member. And I had been in ROTC in high school, um, and I enjoyed it. And I thought the Honor Guard was a great way to participate more in the fire department and participate more in the uh, general public um, and get our uh, public image out there more. I was approached by Rick McLaughlin and asked if I wanted to be part of the Honor Guard unit that he was starting up here in Bedford. 
And I said, sure. I thought it would be a, uh, a great opportunity to give back to the department members and uh, a unique opportunity for myself to get out and uh, I guess explore that other side of the fire service and of the brotherhood. Part of my job at that time was to interact with families. Were, was there a death in our local? So I was going to have to interact with families on a very personal level as it was, and I figured that being putting on that uniform and being heavily involved at, at a funeral, um, that that was a key to what I did and what I wanted to do uh, in that position. I think uh, one of the other things that attracted me to it so much was um, having, having um, seen the funeral for the Worcester, the Worcester Six, having seen firefighter, you know, funerals for Boston guys, um, you know, for other funerals, just seeing the amount of, just the, it's just one of those most powerful things that when you see a bunch of firefighters walking, marching down the street, holding flags and axes and pike poles and, and looking sharp and with solemn faces, that it brings tears to my eyes when I see it now. And I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to be part of that tribute to somebody. Rick wanted to do it because uh, of his father. His father was in the military and had a military funeral and he was really touched by all of that. And he saw a lot of the honor guard stuff going on uh, in the fire service too, and so he wanted to start an honor guard here, and uh, I was I was pretty um, impressed with that, and I was kind of interested in in joining um, because mostly because I'm a joiner, but regardless, I uh, was interested in, in the the history of the honor guard of honor guards in general and what they did for funerals and parades and you know all kinds of stuff like that. So. Uh, that's why I jumped on board uh, with it. I got involved in the Honor Guard shortly after I joined the department. I wasn't actually a, uh, a full member until I was able to get a uniform and other um, equipment for the uh, service. But um, you know, I was involved with it from the pretty much from the time I started around 2006, 2007. I wanted to join the Honor Guard when I first joined the department, um, mostly because I, I have a respect for the uh, service in the community that the Honor Guard serves and I was involved in a program very similar when I was much younger uh, where we did Honor Guard activities and I really enjoyed it and I wanted to continue doing that. My first experience with the Honor Guard was when Chief Wigan died, um, the former Chief Wigan. When the former Chief Wigan died I got to participate in the funeral and was the color guard and really kind of saw the Honor Guard from a distance and I was intrigued by it because of the honor and tradition that it exudes when you see that. And so I kind of thought perhaps that might be a really neat way to jump into understanding what this industry is about from the tradition of um, this service. After I contemplated trying to get into it, I talked to Rick McLaughlin about what's involved. And he set me up with Tom Green, he got the uniform, he went over some of the history of Honor Guard and the armed service and in the fire service and just talk to me a little bit about the importance of going into this with the idea that it's, it's no joke. There's real meaning behind it for the families who we are representing and to the public. They have, we have to look shined, polished. And um, he wanted to make sure that I was up for that. And once I decided that I was, I just signed on the dotted line, I guess. I uh, had the privilege of starting out with uh, Rick McLaughlin on shift when I first started here. Uh, he was the original Honor Guard commander. And I asked him about it. I thought it was really nice. I liked the tradition that the uh, Honor Guard had to offer. I like tradition, I like history, and uh, I joined up with the Honor Guard, and uh, Rick saw to it that I get the training that I needed. As Mikey and I and, and John were thinking about the Honor Guard, what we're gonna do with it, where we want it to go, and how we want to get there with it, one of the major things came up 
was uniform. You've never seen a bunch of guys have so many different opinions about uniforms. Guess who won? The uniform, I wanted a more military look to the uniform because that's more of what I was familiar with from coming from a military family. So we pretty much did that. You know, as far as the picking of the suit coats and any pants topped or untopped, what kind of boots to wear, what kind of hats to wear. It was pretty much a mutual agreement, but I gotta tell you, between Mikey and I, we were going military, and we really, we were really happy, happy with our choices that we made. And there's been very little modification to the uniform since then. So we're pretty happy going on this long, and still have pretty much the original uniform. They're somewhere around 500 a piece with the brass and the, the uh, ceremonial cords, the boots, the shoes, the belts. Uh, in addition to that, there was the equipment we needed. That really was worrisome. We needed uh, ceremonial axe, axes, pike poles, flags, flag poles, flag holders, so much. So much money was needed, so where did we go? We went to Old Faithful Tom Green, the president of the uh, Firefighter Association at the time and current as well. Kudos, Tom. I couldn't do that job. And uh, he's, a, he's a penny pincher, that man. Uh, somehow we squeezed $12,000 out of him. Thank God, because we had no idea where we were going with this. So now we had the money. We had the, the manpower, the money. We had to uh, figure out uniforms. There's a bunch of them out there, different styles, stripes down the leg, no stripes, bibs, ties, open collars, uh, numerous. We had some interesting uh, uh, conversations about that, the three of us, uh, Rick and, and Mike and myself. Uh, I don't want to say heated, but Eh, you know, firefighters are going to be firefighters, and uh, while this was so important to all of us, we all had our, our convictions on what we should wear and how we should wear it, and it evolves. It's evolved to the point where if we do a parade, we'll wear uh, the ceremonial boots and bib the pant leg up. But if we do a casket watch or a funeral, or, uh, we're, we're going to be formal. We're going to wear uh, Bates styled high gloss shoes and so forth. So it was quite an endeavor. Uh, I mean, it even got down to the point where should we have uh, black bell caps or white bell caps? Should we have a department badge or an honor guard badge? What types of gloves should we wear? It was interesting. We had some fun. The uniform selection, uh, that was a process that uh, it, it took a bit of time um, for us uh, because everybody has their own likes and dislikes. Um, and really what it came down to is uh, we decided uh, being uh, myself, uh, Rick McLaughlin, myself and John Axon being kind of the leaders of the Honor Guard at the time uh, when we were forming to uh, get some ideas of what uh, was out there for uniforms and to try to have a couple of options for the members to uh, be able to choose from. So uh, we looked at a variety of different uh, Honor Guard pictures uh, just to get an idea of what different designs were out there. And uh, then we uh, whittled it down to uh, five different uniform designs and we brought that to the rest of the members and allowed them to have a say in it so that way they had a vested interest in it. We actually have two uniforms, one uh, being the, uh, uh, the polo shirt that I'm wearing now, which is more of a, what we call a Class B uniform which we've used to do flag folding details, uh, more like a, a work type of environment. We have uh, black pants and to wear our black boots with them as well. But our class A uniform, our, our dress uniform is probably, if you see honor guards, every one is different. Uh, we did talk about what do we want in styles and I was completely against having a stripe down the side of our uniform pants because when you don't march on a regular basis, Sometimes not everybody's not in step all the time. So if you've ever seen uh, a military or a different type of uh, 
guard or color guard in a parade and they have a stripe on their pants, you can always tell when somebody's out of step. The only thing that has changed over the years is the color of our braids, which we have a, we have a, a red braid, which we started off with initially, which goes off the shoulder. Uh, then we have a memorial braid, which is uh, red and black. And then, for, of course, for St. Patrick's Day, we all trade out to the green braids. That's the Irish part of Rick. Our original uniform, like I said, we had the, all the starting founding members, let's say, had the, the flag pin. Um, we went with a single-breasted coat because we wanted it to be different than our, our regular Class A, which is double-breasted. Um, we had a white hat with, with the red band. Um, we got boots and we had a white belt that went around the middle and the first picture of us as a as a unit everybody's belt <laughs> it was worn a different way so after I became the commander um, you know a few years ago I, I 86 the belt completely because nobody could uh, put it on the right way we we're all different sizes so it sort of fit weird on everybody if we were all you know f five foot eight 165 pounds and had the same uniform the belt would look great but we're not so uh, we got rid of the belt which was a good a good idea I think it looks much better now and we of course have the red ascot as well we got the interest we got the people we got the uniforms we got the equipment now we got to figure out how to do this it, it, it's such an honest uh, heartfelt position to be in and I, I really feel privileged to be part of it still to this day but we don't want to look funny we, we want to really present the department we want to be respectful to the fellow firefighters uh, that we're servicing so we needed the train it, let, let's say this um, the old cliche I can't walk and chew gum is really true for almost every single person I know, particularly uh, Lieutenant Paramedic John Larry. Sorry, John. But we, we finally, uh, he's going to hate me. Uh, we find after that first initial uh, training, a uh, few arguments came here and there, and uh, a lot of uh, poking of fun uh, to guys and so forth. Uh, immediately on my way home, I got a call from Rick. Uh, John, we need to uh, attack this at a, at a different uh, angle because this clearly is not, we need work. Mikey, Mikey was the one who wanted to do training. I want to train him. Yep, you got it, Mikey. Go do it. Do whatever you need to do, brother. So Mikey did a lot, a lot of research and came up with a lot of good stuff on his own, online and through different manuals. You come up with a lot of good stuff there. As far as training the members go, I literally had to teach people, well, I won't say I, we literally had to teach people your left from your right, and how to get one in front of the other in a timely manner. So it was an adventure, holy God, was it an adventure. It was interesting, because uh, when we first started uh, the Honor Guard, uh, and Rick asked me, I, I first looked at it and went, all right, I've never had any military background, uh, but my family was in the military. Uh, did my research, uh, wanted to make sure that we were adhering to uh, the, proper, uh, um, the proper etiquette for uh, marching. So uh, we were using the Marine Corps uh, drill manual um, you know, as our basis of uh, maneuvers and how to march and commands and and uh, how to pay proper respect to uh, everything. So uh, with that, uh, after spending roughly three weeks pulling out my hair, realizing how uh, daunting a task it was, um, we decided to have our first training, at which point I realized no one could walk at the same pace, no one could be in unison, and uh, knew that it was gonna take some time. Um, so uh, we spent uh, quite a bit of time um, off duty, uh, meetings uh, we would meet uh, twice a month just to get ready for uh, our first event that we did was the pre-memorial day parade um, that they wanted us ready for um, which uh, then uh, we uh, it, it took us quite some time to get ready for that. Rick and I went to the National Honor Guard Academy and that was held in um, Connecticut at the Connecticut statewide um, fire academy in like June and it was like a hundred degrees the whole time and we're out there doing PT and 
like all this stuff and the, uh, the National Honor Guard Academy is run by a lot of ex-military guys, Marines and, and Army folk and stuff like that and uh, it, um, it's really learned a ton. They, they teach you so much about why we do the things we do and how we <clears throat> get stuff done and look sharp while we're doing it and, and they PT you a lot. Um, <laughs> And it's all like you pay money to go there and then they, they kind of beat you into the ground a little bit, but it's sort of like a, almost like a little mini boot camp for a week. And, um, you know, you're ironed in your t-shirts and like stuff like that, like crazy stuff, but it's all about, it's all about that. So, um, we did a lot of, we did that, which was a great experience for us. And, um, we were able to bring a lot of that information back to our honor guard and, and help teach, um, our guys to, to be a little bit better and perform a little better during all of our stuff, whether we're presenting colors or marching in a parade or um, doing a casket watch or uh, planning a funeral, they go over that stuff too. There's a lot, a lot of moving parts. Ethan Kozlowski to be a firefighter here. Ethan was, I believe it was National Guard at first and then he went Navy. He was stationed at the Reserve Center over there in Manchester. So when Ethan was here, and he was here during that time period we were training, it was probably about a year we were really trying to get our act together. And um, he was the one who actually introduced me to Dean Kenny. That was an interesting thing. I walked over there and there was nothing but high ranking officials sitting around this round table. And where was John? And where was Mikey? <laughs> it went with me. <laughs> so that was cool. That was a cool experience. So that's kind of how that happened. So our training, basically, we were doing it at first for almost, I don't know, a few, few months, almost a year maybe, and then got introduced to Commander Kenny, who was kind enough to take us, take us by the hand and show us how to do it right. And during that time period when we were doing that, New Boston Fire Department was starting there on a guard. So they kind of came on board with us for that whole adventure. And Earl Lincoln from Hooks at Fire, they were established before we were as far as an honor guard, also came in on that deal because it was a really great opportunity to learn from Commander Kenny who's done this for many, many years. And he had a great team to teach us so. Commander Kenny was a godson. That man didn't even blink an eye and said, yes, I will train you. So it was, uh, it was Rick McLaughlin, Mike Jolin, myself, and I believe Tom Green as well, that were going to be trained to train the guys. And uh, Commander Kenny really went to bat. We, several, many trainings, we went to the four of us up there, and he taught us the military version, which is almost identical to the fire service and the PD, uh, on how to honorably present ourselves at any given ceremony, whether it be a funeral or a parade, anything. When they first came to the Reserve Center, it's, it, it was like no other uh, uh, first team in the sense that um, it was all pretty much the same idea. And if, if you think of it in terms of um, like trying to create a, pot, a piece of pottery, you know, you've got this mound of clay, it doesn't look like anything, it's shapeless, and you know that eventually if you spin the wheel enough and you do it right, you're gonna come up with a very nice piece of pottery. So we kind of approached it in that way and looked at everybody as being, uh, not assuming that they knew anything about anything and just basically started them out from the very beginning. So when they all got there for the first time, obviously we had to go through what they actually knew and test them a little bit on uh, things like uh, uh, marching and cadence and, and uh, marching commands and so they knew how to stop, they knew how to start, they knew which foot to start on. Um, all of that had to be uh, started from the very beginning to make sure everybody was in sync. And then get them used to being in sync. Uh, it's one thing to start off but when you're looking at people in a group and for example one individual is taller than the other, their step tends to be a little bit more, their stride tends to be a little bit longer and so getting them to be a little bit shorter on their stride while making up for someone on the other end who's a little bit shorter and getting them to stretch out a little bit so that when you look at them as they're performing, 
the foot strike is exactly in the same spot for each individual, whether they're short or tall, the heel should be striking in exactly the same spot. So that's some of the, 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 uh, the, the individual issues, if you will, that, uh, that we were starting with in the very beginning. And those are some of the criteria that they had to um, essentially mold themselves to over time. So um, it, they, they were raw in the beginning, but we would expect that with anybody just starting out. But the, the, be the beauty of this really, quite frankly, is, and one of the, I think, the important aspects of doing this outside the, the fire station as opposed to uh, being here is the fact that when they were there, they were focused. That was key. Uh, one of the things about any training aspect is making sure that the individuals that are there to learn the process are, are absolutely focused on the process. So that makes a big difference. When people are there and they're willing to learn and, and they're absolutely um, you know, openly receptive to, uh, to critique and things of that nature, it makes the process a lot easier, it makes it a lot faster, and you actually start to see progress a lot quicker when people are there absolutely focused on what they're doing. So that really was, was a crucial point. And I think Rick was spot on in, in, um, in his endeavor to move the honor guard to a different location so that they could focus on what they were supposed to be doing. Rick McLaughlin. Sorry, Rick, but you're a little short guy. You're old like me, a little older, just so you know. And uh, you got a funny walk to you, and I've, I tried to get you to walk normal, but you know, when you march, you got a funny march. Uh, it is always the funny story of when we first started training, uh, the, whoever was calling out the commands uh, would call out or we marching, you, you turn right, a right turn march. And we always had the one or two guys that turned left or we did an about face and you're supposed to turn left on an about face and the guy would turn right. And so, so those are the funny things that, you know, and, and we all poke fun at them, but you know what, we, it always happens, it happens to us too. So it's, it's fun to do that stuff and it's fun to practice and stuff. And that's why we do practice. So we don't goof up when we're uh, supposed to be at a service. I'm sorry, Lieutenant Bateman, but I gotta bring you out on this one. When we were doing formations one night for our training over at the Reserve Center, you shouldn't show up wearing Crocs, no. But hey, you were there, you are one of the original members, so uh, yeah. Hats off to you, Steve. There are other times where my uh, my belly got in the way of holding a flag, so I had to hold an ax instead. <laughs> or if I held a flag, believe me, I held the American flag because, you know, being on a nice support, it was good. The, these are funny things that happen. I can't help it. It is what it is. Um, so, you know, we did, we did all kinds of, of of funny things and I would ask him, you know, am I doing this right? And he'd say, hmm. And he'd try to show me and it just, I still couldn't do it. But um, but we learned all kinds of crazy things, wheel turns and and uh, and I was never good at that. And I, whenever we did an event and we would, tr we would try, sort of pre-plan it, I would wanna make sure I knew every bit of what I had to do. You know, how many second, how many, how many breaths I had to pause before doing something else. And Rick was always very good, and Mike was always good, and then Rorick was really good, and then Eric Thomas was really good at telling me what I needed to do, and no matter what they told me, how expressly clear they made it to me, I screwed it up every single time. Well, that's because you're wearing Crocs. Trainings were, I, I, like I said, I was terrible. I am terrible at it. And, I, uh, it, and it, when you think, when you're in the training and you're thinking about how when you're actually gonna put this training into effect, when you might be folding a flag at a casket for a, a spouse, the pressure is amazing. I, you know, I'll, I'll, I take 100 fires over folding the flag for um, a, a, somebody who's lost their loved one. Um, and and dur during that pressure, we would all try to laugh it off uh, while we were training. and. And they, they would never let me do anything important because no matter what I did, I screwed it up. Um, I, I could not, they, they wanted to put me in the safest spot, which was generally not holding the American flag because I couldn't hold it high enough and not being on the outside because as soon as we started to do a turn, I think I wanted to do a circle and I, I was just awful. And uh, my boots were like, every time I, my heel clicked, it was off kilter with everybody else. And uh, Rick would yell at me and, and he said, he, <laughs> 
I can't say the things that he would say to me, but he was never, never particularly happy with my performance. Though he, he always, um, he always said, "Thanks for coming in, good job, Steve." But um, I know he secretly wanted me to turn my uniform in because uh, we didn't need another guy that couldn't couldn't march in step. My first event I did was a parade in Manchester, the St. Patrick's Day parade, and I hadn't really had any training up to that. So in the parking lot beforehand, they were trying to show me some of the things I'm supposed to do. And fortunately, you're just marching straight, so um, it was really just about keeping the cadence and the rhythm between each other. And then Rick offered, um, Rick, Rick offered some training at the station once or twice a month, and he worked with me trying to get the turns down and the commands down. And, making sure that we all were on the same page. We don't do it often enough to be incredibly proficient at it, so we still do the parking lot training before the events to make sure that we look like a unit, a cohesive unit. A color guard and an honor guard is really an ambassador. Um, that's their purpose. Um, you know, putting on the, the dress uniform, making sure that everything is, is clean, that it's polished, that it's lined up properly, um, all of that is, is uh, an exhibit of pride. It's an exhibit of pride in your community. It's an exhibit of pride in your uniform and in your service. Um, and so, you know, whether people realize it or not, just knowing how to line your, your awards up uh, over the pocket or making sure that your buttons are all lined up and that all those finite details in the uniform are taken care of before you go out into the street are a critical piece of that pride. And when people see you, when they see how you perform, and when they see how well you look in uniform, and how everything is crisp, and there's no wrinkles, and the, and the shoes are polished, um, that conveys a message. It conveys a message of pride in, in the service, and it conveys a message that they really take their ambassadorial role extremely important. And that, that uh, I think, is, is a critical part of why people do the honor guards and the color guards, and why there's so much attention to the detail in uh, in the uniform and how they perform, uh, because it is a it is a sense of pride, and I think that's a, that's a crucial piece as to why they do it. Now, Lieutenant John Leary will describe the flag folding ceremony as the color guard shows us how to fold the flag. Okay, good evening. The uh, we have six members of the honor guard unit here, which are going to demonstrate a proper way to fold the flag. Most of you have, have, have had an opportunity on TV to see when a flag is properly presented to someone, it's folded in a cocked hat type shape. Uh, the gentlemen here today are going to demonstrate that for you. The honor guard will demonstrate the proper way to fold the flag. First, they'll fold the flag in half. Next, they'll fold the flag again in half with the field of blue stars to the top and to the outside. Now they'll make a triangle from the bottom corner up to the top. The first flat fold of the flag is a symbol of life. The second fold is a symbol of our belief in the eternal life. The third fold is made in honor and remembrance of the veteran departing our ranks, who gave a portion of life for the defense of our country to attain a peace throughout the world. The fourth fold represents our weaker nature. As for American citizens trusting in God, it is to him we turn in times of peace as well as in times of war for his divine guidance. The fifth fold is a tribute to our country. For in the words of Stephen Decor, our country, in dealing with other countries, may she always be right, but it is our, still our country, right or wrong. The sixth fold is for where our hearts lie. It is with our heart that we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
The seventh fold is a tribute to our armed forces, for it is through the armed forces that we protect our country and our flag against all her enemies, whether it be found within or without the boundaries of our republic. The eighth fold is a tribute to the one who entered into the valley of the shadow of death, that we might see the light of day and to honor mother for whom it flies on Mother's Day. The ninth fold is a tribute to womanhood, for it has been through their faith, love, loyalty, and devotion that the character of the men and women who have made this country great have been molded. The tenth fold is a tribute to Father, for he too has given his sons and daughters for the defense of our country since they were first born. The eleventh fold in the eyes of a Hebrew citizen represents the lower portion of the seal of King David and King Solomon and glorifies in their eyes the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The twelfth fold in the eyes of a Christian citizen represents an emblem of eternity and glorifies in their eyes God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. When the flag is completely folded, the stars are uppermost, reminding us of our national motto, In God We Trust. After the flag is completely folded and tucked in, it takes on the appearance of a cocked hat, ever reminding us of the soldiers who served under General George Washington and the sailors and Marines who served under Captain John Paul Jones, who were followed by their comrades and shipmates in the armed forces of the United States, preserving for us the rights, privileges, and the freedoms we enjoy today. When John, Mike, and I developed the honor guard. It was for a pretty specific purpose. You know, it was for, it was for funerals, it was for memorials. We had a pretty limited scope of what we wanted to do. As it developed, it, the scope expanded. Eric Thomas was a pretty big proponent of making sure that we had somebody down at Emmitsburg every year representing Bedford Fire. They get down there and they fold the flags that's going to be presented to the family. It's a great, great honor to do that. I think Bedford Fire Department is one of the fire departments that have one of the longest standing records of going down there to do that. So I think with each commander, over time, you're going to see it expand in different avenues. And each commander probably could give you a better idea of what they want to do with it. And I don't know how, I don't know how Earl, I, I think Earl, Earl Lincoln from Hooks at Fire was tapped to be the commander for, you know, um, you know, the honor guard commander for the National Fallen Firefighters Memorial for that year, for 2009, either nine or 10. I don't remember, I think it was 2009. So he was tied in. So when he had the opportunity to bring other honor guards in, he called us. He called the Connecticut Statewide Honor Guard um, because they're, they're, they were tied in pretty closely with the National Honor Guard Academy. And we went down there and we re-engineered the way that they folded the flags. How they were folding it previous was, um, you know, it, it's a tough flag to fold because they're three by five flags. They're not casket flag, so to do the same fold that you would do a casket flag um, is nearly impossible. So we, we sort of re-engineered that and, and came up with a better fold, and, and then after that year, we just they just kept asking us back, so we, we kept coming back as a as the, the sort of like core QA team, so it was, it's myself and Earl Lincoln and Mark Rourke, um, who's the current commander of the Honor Guard, uh, 
and then usually another guy from Hooks It that will kind of come in and out, and, and Captain Bob Setta from Scranton, uh, the Scranton Fire Department. So we're the we're the core QA group that comes in and, and does that whole detail. We set it all up. We contact um, departments from around the country that have had line of duty deaths and ask them if they want to come. They have an honor guard, and some say yes, some say no, uh, but we end up getting a few usually, which is really great. And it's a whole weekend of kind of bonding with those guys and, and showing them what we do and, and folding flags. And, and it really makes a huge impact on, on us and on the families of the fallen when they come to Emmitsburg to the big show in October um, and they get handed a flag uh, from somebody with a rose. That's a flag that we've all touched. You know, we've all folded them. So um, stuff like that is really, really amazing to be involved with. So. It's pretty powerful, especially when you see these guys, you know, you talk about like Grand Amount and Hot Shots who lost 19 guys, which is like a third of their department. They're not very big. And those guys came and folded flags and they were, they were amazed. Um, they, they felt super comfortable as soon as they met everybody and they understood that we know what they've been through. Um, and even if you haven't had a line of duty death in your department, when you're around it and you, you're an honor guard member, um, you get that sense and you, you understand and you know what people are looking for and, and the emotional support that you can give them because you've been there um, is really something that they value a lot. So it's, it's definitely worth it. Um, I think one of the, the most lasting memories that I have of the Honor Guard um, is going down to Emmitsburg, Maryland every year for flag folding. Uh, Eric Thomas, I know, uh, has talked about this. Um, I'm sure Rick Rick has been down before. Um, there's been a number of members that have been down before. And again, you see members throughout the country, fire department members throughout the country, who've lost someone um, in the line of duty, similar to us with Lieutenant Clark. And I'll tell you, it puts a different perspective in when those families get presented the flag um, in September or in October, rather, uh, it definitely it definitely puts an impact that you were down there, you folded those flags, you touched those flags, and each of them was fo folded ceremoniously and uh, with respect and dignity. So. I have attended uh, many of the honor flights throughout uh, over the years. When the honor flight started up several years ago, they invited uh, our Bedford Fire Department Honor Guard to participate as, long, as well as uh, members. And the Bedford Fire Department Honor Guard has participated in several of the honor flight uh, at the Manchester Regional Airport. We were lucky to participate in 2014 when the retired Assistant Chief Earl Isham uh, was able to go on the honor flight. And it was, a, it was a great, great thing. How about something about today? Where are you going today? Highlights of my life going to Washington. You going to Washington? Then my bride is going to kick me off. <laughs> she is? <laughs> oh, yeah. Big day for me. Big day for you. So you feel good? Yeah, I do. All right. Thank you, Earl. Take good care of the time while I'm gone. Thanks for your service. You're okay. Frank, you're his guardian? Well, I'm his guardian for the day. I'm taking to D.C. to see the World War II Memorial Arlington Cemetery and share a day with his comrades. All right. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Previous fire chief Ralph Wiggin, uh, when he passed away, the honor guard was very instrumental in uh, 
helping with the service. The church service was conducted at the Presbyterian Church. And then there was a motorcade that took uh, the casket from the church all the way down to the BCTV facility, which at one time was the fire station, and that a small service was held there, and the ringing of the three fives was done on the old Sanford. And after that service, the uh, body was taken to the cemetery, and then there was a, uh, a graveside service done at the cemetery again with the honor guard. So it was a very comprehensive detail a lot of people participated in it. it was a good turnout and uh, the honor guide was very instrumental in providing a lot of assistance for that so before i came to the bedford fire department i worked for the hopkinton fire department and a much smaller organization smaller community and uh, we didn't have an honor guard and unfortunately in uh, september of 2012 our chief uh, chief rick schaefer uh, passed away it was he was on duty at the time when he had uh, a heart attack so it was classified as a line of duty death and um, we knew two things uh, that we wanted to honor him uh, the right way we wanted to pay tribute to our fallen chief and really honor him so we knew that and we knew we had no idea how to do that um, we, you know we hadn't prepared for an honor guard we hadn't prepared for casket watches or anything like that so um, the next, the very next day, uh, Mark Close, who was the deputy chief of the Bedford Fire Department at the time, Frank Fretzel, who's the chief of the Litchfield Fire Department and also lives in Bedford on the Bedford Fire Department, and Earl Lincoln uh, from the Hooksett Fire Department. The very next day, the three of them showed up and were like, we're going to teach you how to do this right and be able to honor him. So uh, we kind of had like a three-day mini boot camp of how to do a casket watch, how to march correctly, how to stand at attention how to salute properly, all these things that you kind of think you know how to do, but there is a right and a wrong way to do it. So they came and taught us that. So it was a very long week. Uh, we still had a fire department to run. We still had fire calls and EMS calls to take care of. And in the afternoon, we would uh, drill on uh, the formations and marching with Earl and uh, the chief close and um, Frank Fretzel. And then in the evening, we had a funeral to plan still. We had a funeral, a memorial, and uh, the, the wake to plan. So it was a long week, a very emotionally draining week, but uh, emotionally rewarding too, because we knew that we did it right. We honored him right. It meant a lot to the family, and it meant a lot to the fire department as well. Um, Kathy Schaefer, Chief Schaefer's wife, um, selected me to ring the bell for the 555 ceremony. Uh, during the funeral right before the chief was uh, his uh, casket was lowered into the ground and um, Ironically enough, I ended up working for the Bedford Fire Department as I'm here now a few years later And I have a picture of me ringing the bell and who is standing behind me, but the Bedford Honor Guard um, and and I once I realized that I thanked the guys and it was kind of oh you know that's the expectation and I can tell you um, for a Hopkins and firefighter that is not the expectation our expectation was kind of that yeah our surrounding communities that we work with every day you know um, Concord and Henniker Warner Webster those communities those firefighters would come to honor the chief but the Bedford Fire Department, another county away, miles away, that they would come and represent and train us too. That was not the expectation. It, it completely blew us away as the firefighters and the family. Uh, they were really touched by that. You know, some of the things I think the Honor Guard really helps with, uh, one, it sh shows pride of the organization. Honor Guards uh, attend different functions. You know, if you look at some of the functions in Bedford, we've done, you know, funerals. Obviously, we had the line of duty death of Lieutenant uh, James Clark on April 11, 2013. And working, it, when we were going through that process of Jim's death, you know, the, the first immediate um, hours after his death, the, the Honor Guard members were actually at the funeral home in their Class A uniforms. They were actually stationed at the New Hampshire Medical Examiner's Office doing a 24-hour vigil in their Class A and, and um, Honor Guard uniforms. And that really meant a lot to the families and to the other members of the fire department that Jim was never alone. 
And some people, probably the lay person doesn't understand what that means. But for us in the fire service, we never left Jim alone. Um, and, and that's huge. And that's an impact that I'll always take for the rest of my career. I could go on forever uh, about Lieutenant Clark. When Le Lieutenant Clark died, it was a shock to everyone in this department. And as soon as the chief found out, he sent out an inter department text and email for everybody to come to the department that moment and everybody did and he broke the news and it was tough uh, tough so the honor guard uh, of course needed to do everything we do uh, So it goes back to firefighter training to its best. When we go to a fire, we know what to do. It kicks in and you remember and you do what has to be done to save life, property, uh, and be safe doing it. It just kicks in. It's training, it's drilled into you. It was questionable whether or not any of us would be able to do it with Lieutenant Clark. However, we did. When it happens to you, it happens. You hope you can do what you can. You hope you can do the best. You hope you can make the family proud. So with that in mind, I think, yes, we had all everything in place because we had done this so many times before. We had everything in place. We knew what we were going to do, when we were going to do it, how we were going to do it, and more importantly, who was going to do it. Because that's one of the harder things to do is be, sometimes you say, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll present the flight to the family, and then that's the one thing you can't do. <laughs> so we had a pretty good plan because we had developed this throughout the years, you know, from all the funerals that we've done in the past, from all the memorials that we've done in the past. So we were well-trained and well-versed in it. So yeah, we, we felt prepared for it. A lot of people wanted to know how they could help out, what they could do. And there were people that were in the honor guard that couldn't necessarily do certain duties. They did other things, and it was great. I mean, everybody stepped up, did what they needed to do, but we were able to really, really keep it as tight of a family as I've ever seen here at Bedford Fire. It uh, was a time where we could really take care of our own like a family does. It was a good solid feeling that, yeah, we're ready for this. The impact that the Honor Guard leaves with the family is palpable. I worked with Jim Clark's family as the liaison between the family and the department. And I went through the days following Jim's death with them and it was, it was pretty challenging. It was really pretty gut-wrenching on so many levels. And when the Honor Guard was presented at the wake and at the funeral, I could see for the first time his family smile. I saw his mom smile, which she just lost her son. That's, that's really tough. And she was so, she appeared to be so taken by the tribute to her son that it was kind of also at that moment I realized the value of the honor guard and, um, and his daughter's kind of feeling like, wow, this is all for my dad. That's a lasting impact on a family. I just talked to Steph Clark yesterday. We talk all the time. She calls and wishes me a happy Mother's Day or I'm very close and I wasn't beforehand. I didn't really know them at all, but obviously that's this industry is you become a family and the family of the fallen become our family for life. And his girls are basically like kids to me now. We were all reeling when that happened. And, you know, to have a guy that we spent, you know, I'd spent, you know, 12 or 13 or 14 years with, you know, um, and was like, you know, was a, was a just, we all loved him. 
for him to for him to have passed was terrible and tragic um you know and we all wanted to step up to show him show him off in a way that was a proper tribute to his service for the town of Bedford and and to the to the people he worked with um so we all did the very best that we could um you know but we were all emotional but at that time when you're in those when you're when you're doing that particular job you have to set your emotion aside and really focus on what your task is at hand so that you do what you need to do and then you know so for that for that time period from at the wake to the funeral service you kind of have to shut off your shut off your emotional faucets and 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 get your job done and then when it's over with then you can you know then you can do your start your grieving process we all hope to our heart of hearts that 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 we will be able to touch them deeply and and make them feel uh honored and respected um ultimately that's our goal is to make sure that um the families feel that this group of, of people that their loved ones served with um will be with them and uh forever and um that's a hard that's a hard thing to wrap your head around um and it's not one that I can understand myself having never gone through it but I know that we want to project uh, the most the highest level of care and love and respect that we can and this is one of the ways that we do it by doing the time honor traditions of the fire service and uh doing them to the best of our ability. I believe with the passing of Lieutenant Clark, uh we were ready. Um I know in the back of everyone's mind and I believe when uh Rick McLaughlin started the honor guard, I honestly think that that was kind of in the back of everyone's mind that, you know, we hope that we don't have to do this, uh, but I believe that we were prepared to to do this after Lieutenant Clark passed. Um, naturally, we practice and stuff, but we were far ahead of uh, if we, rather than if we didn't practice it during the course of our time. And you escort a family through the sea of blue and all the flags, and these families are coming from a small world like Goffstown, New Hampshire, when Jim died and they see the representation from California, Alaska, Florida, Wyoming, Colorado, Montana, you name it. And we're walking them through these seas of blue of the honor guards. It's overwhelming for a family. Being a recipient of a folded flag stays with you forever. It doesn't go away. So I think it has a big impact. If you're a fire department looking to put together a, an honor guard, it, it's important, one thing, it's not just buying equipment and learning how to march, it's having a commitment. Uh, an honor guard is different than a color guard. Uh, you know, we've all been, we've all seen that, see the color guard marching down the street, but an honor guard is a lot different. It is a commitment because you're going to honor someone's family member. Uh, you're going to graveside. You're going to uh, present the colors at a, uh, local or state or national type program and it is a lot of pride. Uh, if you are going to put an, together an honor guard, suggest learn, tra uh, train. Uh, we sent a couple of our guys to honor guard commander school which is five days long. Uh, learn how to do it properly. If you're going to be an honor guard, you need to stand out. Is it worth it to, ha to help other departments uh, form their own honor guards? I, I think so personally. Um, I think it's, it's an important part of the department. Uh, I think that it's an important part of the, of the team building, uh, the group morale, and uh, if, if they have the commitment that they can put towards getting the equipment and getting the training, uh, it would benefit their group in the long run. My advice to fire departments that are really interested in starting an owner guard, find six people that will do it. One of the most important things is finding six people who are going to dedicate themselves. There's a lot of places don't reimburse you for your time. Don't reimburse you for, for going places and doing, and doing details. 
So find six people who are really dedicated to do it. They don't have to be anybody in particular, all sizes, shapes can do this, but the dedication is the part where you really need to think about who do I want to do this, pulling my team together. Uh, all in all, it, it was way more than I ever, ever, ever could have ever imagined being. Uh, the fire service is great camaraderie and friendship, but this honor guard, when, when, when you're at an event, especially a funeral, an awake, graveside services, the bond that's created is above all. It's, you know, I've, I've had many, many fun times with these guys, taking a bus trip to Manchester to do the parade, doing the parade in Boston. Uh, we were not even going to talk about that, but it was fun, let me tell you. <laughs> we had good times, sad times, uh, but truth be told, not one person on this honor guard would change a, a thing, including myself. We have a lot of new members here on the Bedford Fire Department that have expressed interest. What we need to do is get interests aligned with meetings and get those meetings aligned with trainings. And we'll have to take those steps to move forward to get everybody together. Because there are a lot of encouraging up and coming members, members that uh, had former military experience, know how to march, they know how to do a lot of things that we're already doing. They'd be a great addition. We need to keep the, the younger uh, men and women coming up through the fire service involved in the honor guard and keep them with that uh, pride and commitment and honor uh, that we give to the members because at some point, uh, whether you're you know, God forbid something happens to you in line of duty or you retire uh, and, you know, the honor guard is going to be there at your funeral. You're, you're part of the Bedford Fire Department or, for that matter, you're part of some other fire department that hopefully has an honor guard uh, that's going to take care and, and, and honor you in the way you should be for the position that you, you've, attained, you know, you've had during the course of your lifetime. There are a lot less people now and I think it's a generational issue. A lot less people now understand what an honor guard is. We're all living longer, so you don't see it. We've been pretty successful in the conflicts that we've gotten into where our numbers of casualties aren't what they used to be compared to the Vietnam era and all that. So our honor guard is a thing of the past. I hope not. But I'm not sure. If you look around and then you ask yourself, how many honor guards do I really know? How many honor guard members do I really know? You'll find it's far in between, very far, very few out there. So are they a thing of the past? I hope not. I hope they're not, I hope honor guards are not a thing of the past. They, it's, there's many things in this industry that have fallen to the wayside. Firefighter musters and you know the whole brotherhood of everybody hanging out together. A lot of that is changing because of the pace of life. But this is kind of one element that should be withstanding over time because of what it means to the fallen brothers and sisters who've gone before us and what it means to the industry as a whole and the tradition and honor that comes with wearing a badge that I, I'm hopeful that it, they, this will continue and honor God will continue. That's why we're telling this story. Rick, Rick came to me when I was considering joining the honor God he told me the whole story of how it happened and how it evolved and how he really wanted to do this. And I said to him, you need to document that because you're not gonna be around forever and you need to make sure people that come after you understand the importance of this. So you need to make a story out of this. And then he came to me a couple months ago and said, remember when you said we should make a story? I wanna do that. And I said, okay, let's talk to Thatcher. <laughs> The fire service of today is ever-changing. 
but one that remains steeped in traditions of over 200 years. One such tradition is the sounding of the bell. In the past, as firefighters began their tour of duty, it was the bell that signaled the beginning of that day's shift. Throughout the day and the night, each alarm was sounded by a bell, which summoned these brave souls to fight fires and to place their lives in jeopardy for the good of their fellow citizen. And when the fire was out and the alarm had come to an end, it was the bell that signaled to all the completion of that call. When a firefighter dies in the line of duty, making the supreme sacrifice, it was the mournful toll of the bell that solemnly announced a comrade's passing. We utilize these traditions as symbols which reflect honor and respect for those who have given so much and who have served so well. To symbolize the devotion that firefighters have for their duty, box 555 will be transmitted, representing the end of that firefighter's duties and that they will be returning to quarters. And so, to those who have selflessly given their lives for the good of the citizens of New Hampshire, their tasks completed, their duties well done. To our comrades, on their last alarm, they are going home. 